Good morning, welcome to my presentation, Rewilding the Golf Course. My name is Steve Thompson. I've been a greenkeeper at John O'Gaunt Golf Club in Bedfordshire for 30 years. My main interest back uh, from a young age has always been birds and bird watching. Uh, so working outside, you know, it was going to be an obvious choice for me. Uh, but back when I started at the golf course in 1990, I, di I didn't realise the, the extreme potential that a golf course could have for, for wildlife uh, and conservation in general. Uh, and my interest in all forms of wildlife uh, has increased dramatically since I first started, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see throughout the presentation tonight. I'm very passionate about birds, wildlife in general, particularly on a golf course, and hopefully that will come across in the presentation. Now, golf courses have got a bit of a reputation for being uh, rubbish for wildlife, barren deserts, uh, grass cut wall to wall, uh, but I can assure you that is not the case and it offers an enormous variety of habitats um, for all sorts of different wildlife as, you, as you'll see as we uh, progress through the slides. But to put uh, golf courses into a bit of context, there are over two and a half thousand golf courses in the UK covering approximately 150,000 hectares. 90 of those are designated as triple SIs. Uh, as you can see from just a few photos below, uh, offers a, a massive variety of habitat. Uh, golf courses by the coast, uh, woodland, uh, Mountains, even I think in the background, I think that's in Scotland. Uh, chalk down land, uh, parkland courses, uh, this is heathland courses, it's a huge variety of course uh, habitat, uh, offers great potential for, for all sorts of uh, different wildlife. Where does John O'Gaunt fit into this uh, picture? Well, uh, John O'Gaunt Golf Club is situated about five minutes up the road from the RSPB headquarters uh, near Sandy in Bedfordshire. Uh, we've got two 18-hole courses, the John O'Gaunt and Carthagena, uh, covers around 162 hectares, variety of habitats, uh, being a parkland course, obviously there's lots of trees, woodland, uh, including a 600-year-old oak. Uh, we've got a brook that runs through uh, the John O'Gaunt uh, course. Uh, we've got a large pond now, which which I shall talk about later on, uh, which has been an absolute uh, delight for uh, bats and dragonflies, uh, lots of bluebells in, in some of the woodland uh, and some gorse bushes as well on the Carthagena side. We're going to talk about a couple of projects I've been involved with uh, at the club uh, and then uh, I'll go on to talk about the different wildlife I've recorded uh, over the two courses. And the first project uh, that I started uh, at the club uh, is the Nest Box project, way back in 1996, uh, and it's still ongoing. Uh, it started with uh, the installation of a barn owl box. Uh, they utilised it for the first couple of years. Uh, and then the barn owls seemed to depart uh, the course. Um, uh, there wasn't really any sightings until about 2008-2009. Uh, we put another barn owl box up on the Carthagena course. Uh, and then it was another few years again before there was any sightings. Uh, and in 2012, we re recorded uh, two pairs of barn owls uh, nesting, uh, one on each side. Uh, and that was a very wet year. Uh, and unfortunately, although they did have chicks, none of the chicks survived. And then in 2016, uh, we had success. Uh, on the Carthagena box. They bred successfully, they had four chicks. Uh, this is one of those chicks which uh, which I was lucky enough to be able to hold uh, and ring. Uh, all four chicks fledged successfully and to date that is our, our best ever success for barn owls. Um, they haven't nested in any of the boxes uh, since but uh, they did appear to nest in a natural cavity in a tree on the John O'Gaunt course uh, this year. Next uh, big uh, bird box really to go up was uh, a kestrel box uh, which was uh, on the John O'Gaunt course which was uh, put up in 1998. 
uh, wasn't used by Kestrels for the first couple of years, but it has been used uh, by Kestrels uh, in most years since. Uh, we've also had an another Kestrel box put up on the Carthagena course. Uh, this particular box, uh, this particular picture uh, was of the Carthagena box. Um, features two chicks uh, in the photo. Uh, the larger of the chick was the first egg to hatch. Uh, egg two failed and smaller chick being egg three. Uh, both these uh, chicks fledged successfully. Uh, in the last couple of years uh, we've had Kestrel's nest on both sides raising seven chicks between them uh, on each occasion. Uh, and this year uh, the Kestrel didn't nest in either of the boxes but they did appear to nest uh, in a natural cavity in a tree on the edge of the practice area raising two chicks. The nest box project then continued uh, in about uh, 2000. Uh, I started putting up a few small boxes uh, on the John O'Gaunt course uh, for birds like blue tit and great tit. Uh, as you can see uh, with that photo on the left. Uh, that carried on increasing over the following years, uh, adding more boxes of different sizes like the box on the right which uh, housed a number of species, tawny owl, jackdaw, uh, grey squirrel and stock dove. Uh, we now have 125 boxes over the two courses. There's a few pictures of chicks in boxes. Uh, top left, uh, 14 blue tits, which we've had a couple of times. Uh, great tits in a box, they're probably the two most common species uh, in boxes. And we've also got a couple of tawny owl chicks and two stock dove chicks. It's not just birds that uh, will use nest boxes. Uh, hornets uh, took over one of the A-frame barn owl boxes on the Carthagena course uh, a few years ago. Uh, built this amazing structure uh, you can see with the picture on the right. Uh, I had an expert came in uh, towards the end of the year and removed the nest uh, and some of the hornets for a project at a university. Uh, an amazing structure, I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, just a few numbers for you for the nest box project since 2005 the boxes have produced over five and a half thousand chicks uh, you can see the numbers for yourself there but nearly four thousand blue tits and over 1500 great tits there's a huge amount of chicks released into the local area increasing uh, the local biodiversity uh, the other project i've been involved with uh, at the club is operation pollinator uh, given the 70% declining bee populations. It's a national project designed to create wildflower areas uh, in out of play areas of the golf course uh, to provide nectar and pollen rich habitat for all pollinating insects, not just bees. Uh, we started this project in 2011, uh, preparing the area, scarifying the ground, sowing the seed. And in 2012 uh, was really wet and produced an amazing display uh, of flowers. Of the original area we chose for Operation Pollinator next to the brook between a couple of fairways out of play uh, and it's doing extremely well um, providing a fantastic habitat for an array of pollinating insects such as bees, butterflies and moths. Photos uh, of wildflower areas from around the course. Uh, very colourful. Two pictures there, as you can see, which uh, is always a delight for the members where, when, when they're playing their round. Uh, and bottom right shows an area where I've introduced yellow rattle. Uh, the idea behind that is to try and combat the thicker grasses and the weeds. We don't want to encourage the wildflowers uh, to grow. Uh, and so far, it has proved successful and uh, it is hoped that uh, we can uh, bring in more yellow rattle into other areas to, to help improve them for the pollination insects. And these are some of the bees that have been seen. I think in, uh, in 2012 we had a survey done uh, and they found at least five species of bumblebee um, uh, in, in that one area, so it's like the advert says, it's doing exactly what it says on the tin. Um, a long way it continue. 
as I mentioned earlier, my main interest uh, has, has always been birds. Now, I've recorded 106 species of bird uh, over the two courses. Most of those I've seen myself. Uh, top left there, waxwing, which we get some winters if it's particularly cold. Uh, increasingly common uh, and regular visitor now is the red kite. Uh, little egret, once a rare bird in the UK, is, is now uh, visiting uh, the golf course. Uh, we've got kingfisher uh, along the brook, um, grey heron you'll see quite often, and great spotted woodpecker um, on the feeders outside the uh, conservatory. Um, I'm not going to list all the birds, uh, probably slightly more unusual records. Uh, reed warbler recorded one June in, the, in a hedge at the side of the road. Uh, the old record of sage warbler and uh, ospreys uh, passing over now and again. Uh, good selection of birds uh, to seen uh, on both courses. We have 22 species of mammal recorded on the course. Uh, picture on the left there is of uh, a set of fallow deer antlers that I found one morning. Uh, they were that fresh. Uh, there's still blood uh, on the end of them you can just about make out. Uh, I've also seen a small herd of fallow deer on the course recently. Uh, there's a, a fox cub um, in centre picture uh, and water vole there on the right, uh, which uh, I'll go into uh, more detail uh, in a few slides. We have badgers on the course, uh, not always a greenkeeper's favourite animal as they can cause uh, some damage. Uh, but I absolutely love them. I do badger watches uh, for, for the members and people from the local community uh, and they always prove extremely popular uh, and book out very quickly. Uh, this particular video clip uh, is from a few years ago um, and the badger is only two to three meters away uh, from me and I felt extremely privileged to be able to get this close to a, a magnificent animal. I mentioned uh, we've got uh, water vole and it's an endangered species, it's protected, uh, its numbers have been declined, declining uh, over the years. Uh, in 2015 we had a survey done uh, and John Golf Course uh, was the best place in the whole of Bedfordshire for, for water vole. Lots of holes, lots of feeding signs, droppings. Uh, um, really was privileged uh, to have uh, that accolade. Team, we had the same survey done along the brook by the same woman, uh, and she found absolutely no sign whatsoever of any water vole. Uh, that was probably down to the furry little critter North American mink in this video clip. It's not all bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, in 2020, despite everything that's been going on, the water vault returned to John Gorn. Hopefully, this time, it's here to stay. Right, this is a little video clip uh, of an otter filmed uh, on a trail cam underneath one of the bridges along the brook. Uh, fairly regular visitor between August and April. I've recorded eight species of bat on the two courses, a common and soprano pipistrelle, serotine, noctual, brown longed, dulbentons, probable natteras and barbastel. Uh, I've been doing regular bat walks uh, for the members uh, and you know bringing in a local expert uh, and the last couple of years um, on a warm summer's night uh, down by the new pond uh, with the aid of bat detectors obviously this is what you could hear. Uh, the pond was absolutely covered with, with bats, still bentons uh, always associated with water uh, and pipistrelle uh, and it was absolutely amazing sight uh, for those that uh, witnessed it. 
few reptiles and amphibians recorded, just five species. Graph snake, as you can see in this picture. Uh, frog, common toad, nasa jack toad, reported once, common lizard. I've had the odd report of adder as well. I suspect, though, that they're mis id and they were actually uh, grass snake. Uh, but uh, I shall be keeping my eyes open and, um, and looking out for adder in the future. I've recorded 25 species of butterfly on the course, including this amazing purple emperor, uh, common butterflies uh, like the comma, and the rather striking black and white of the marbled white, and also scarcer butterflies such as the white letter hair streak seen there resting on my finger. I've recorded around 400 species of moth at the club since October 2015, uh, including this rather uh, striking and gorgeous uh, large elephant hawk moth, uh, Jersey tiger, privet hawk moth, and the rather beautiful scarlet tiger moth, and also scarce moths like this uh, white spotted pinion uh, in the middle which uh, is an exclusive uh, elm feeder uh, is only found in a uh, few parts of the UK such as Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire. And now we come to the best bit of the morning. Dragonflies and damselflies that's what we're all here for. Magnificent uh, insects they are uh, and I've I've become much more appreciative of them uh, and much more passionate about them and very much more interested in them in the last few years. Uh, this is probably one of my favourites, if not my most favourite, banded demoiselle. It's a beautiful dragonfly, iridescent, I think that's the right word, blue, very obvious, seen up and down the brook throughout the summer months. It's a beautiful dragonfly, or damselfly in this case. A few more uh, dragonflies, the uh, full spotted chaser there, top left, uh, a new addition to the course a couple of years ago. Uh, Emperor dragonfly there, I actually managed to get a picture of one sat still, uh, which I was quite surprised at. Uh, Southern hawker there, bottom left, and migrant hawker there on the right. A few more dragonflies, or damselflies. Uh, the uh, blue-tailed damselfly, which was a new addition to the course uh, a couple of years ago. Also, ruddy darter. And small red-eyed damselflies, uh, which were new to the to the course uh, last year, which just suddenly appeared all over the pond. And also, uh, pictured there, bottom right, uh, a male black-tailed skimmer, uh, which was new. Uh, into to the course in 2018 seen there resting on one of the rocks around the pond seen here in this photo a copulating pair of large red damselflies uh, which we get uh, now and again uh, along the brook That was uh, a short video clip of a female emperor dragonfly laying eggs in the pond. Uh, confirmation of the species breeding at the golf club. The azure damselfly, as you can see on the left there, was a new addition to the course just this year. Uh, and it's nice to get a comparison photo next to a similar species, the common blue damselfly. Uh, the the azure has probably been overlooked in the past uh, as they're both quite similar when uh, you just get fleeting glimpses. But, uh, hopefully I'll be able to see a few more of these next year. And finally the willow emerald damselfly. Uh, only new to the UK in 1979 before reaching Bedfordshire in 2012 and finally to John O'Gourt Golf Club in 2019. Uh, when it happened to land on the leaf right in front of me. Uh, onto a few other insects. Uh, there's lots of rough grassland, uh, short grass, long grass, grass that we don't cut in wildlife in the wildflower areas. Uh, and in a hot summer, it's an absolute haven for sort of grasshopper type insects. Uh, long wing conehead, uh, a couple of different bush crickets there. Um, 
if you're walking through the long grass, if you happen to lose your ball, you know, you'll probably come across these jumping across your foot as you're wading through the grass trying to find your ball. It's not just uh, animals I recall is on the course. Uh, lots of fungi as well. I do fungi walks uh, with uh, local experts. Uh, there's just a few pictures of the 134 species I've recorded uh, on, on the two courses. Uh, dead man's fingers, uh, fly agaric, beef steak and shaggy ink cap. I also help arrange uh, bird ringing demonstrations uh, at the club with volunteers from the BTO. Um, it's it's a great way of allowing people to see birds um, up close that they perhaps ordinarily wouldn't see. Uh, we can explain to them about the ringing. What, what it is, why we do it, uh, and it, it's a great way that, for getting the members involved in, you know, in conservation. Here's just some of the birds uh, we've ringed uh, around the course. Uh, top left, obviously, blue tit, uh, despite its size, and give a nice little peck. Uh, long tailed tit, uh, rather beautiful. Uh, small bird, uh, nuthatch there, uh, green woodpecker, uh, which we get quite a few of around the course, uh, magpie uh, on the right there, I think we've only caught one, and I was privileged enough to be able to hold uh, and ring uh, a kingfisher uh, in November last year, uh, one of two that we caught on that particular day, which were both safely released. Communication to a much wider audience helps spread the conservation message. Uh, I've tried to do this, or have done this in, in a number of ways. Uh, golf club newsletter and notice board, uh, BBC TV, local radio, village newsletters, uh, local newspaper, national magazines, uh, Facebook and other social media such as Twitter um, are becoming an increasingly important part of our everyday lives and an essential tool to spread the conservation motivation message. But as well as all that, I've spoken at uh, various greenkeeping seminars, Badger Trust Conference in 2016, local wildlife groups, schools, local youth clubs, British Bird Watching Fair, which I'm sure many of you have been to, and of course, Dragonfly Conference. I believe communication is an extremely important part uh, in, in spreading the, the conservation, conservation message uh, and the good things that you know golf courses do. But my efforts uh, have helped John Gaunt to win national and local awards in conservation. Uh, we won the Nature Conservation Award in 2012 with the Gulf Environment Awards. I shall talk about them separately in a minute. Uh, CPRE Mark, that's the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England. Uh, we won their top award in the local CPRE Bedfordshire Living Countryside Awards in 2014. Uh, we won the Operation Pollinator Award in 2017 for uh, wildflower areas which you saw earlier in the in the slideshow uh, and I won uh, Conservation Greenkeeper of the Year in 2018. Now, I mentioned about the Gulf Environment Awards they've been running since 1995 their aim is to recognize reward and promote outstanding individuals and golf courses doesn't matter how big the golf course is it can be nine holes 18 holes 36 holes or or even more um, lots certainly I've become more aware in the last few years many more green keepers and golf clubs are putting more much more time and effort into protecting and preserving their unique surroundings making making it much more suitable for wildlife um, uh, all sorts of wildlife, birds, butterflies, bees, 
insects, mammals, everything. Uh, there's a lot more work going into it and this is a fantastic way of rewarding all the hard work that people put in. What does the future hold? Well, continued monitoring of the nest boxes, that's an ongoing project, expanding the wildflower areas, creating more pollen rich uh, areas for, for bees uh, etc. Uh, keep educating the members and the local community, very important to keep the local community involved uh, and letting them know what's going on in their golf course. Uh, we always try to keep conservation in mind when working on the course. This is just a short uh, TV clip for, from a few years ago. Uh, just is a nice summary of everything I've tried to do on the course. Now to a man with a passion for bird watching and nest boxes. Steve Thompson is a greenkeeper at the John O'Gaunt Golf Club near Sandy in Bedfordshire. Beautiful golf course. It all started nine years ago with just a few nest boxes. Now he's put up more than a hundred. Our environment reporter Richard Daniel reports on the difference one person can make. Pristine fairways. <laughs> manicured greens. Getting a golf course to this standard requires fertilisers and weed killers. On the face of it, not that good for wildlife. But Steve Thompson didn't think it had to be that way. Right from probably back uh, primary school, I've been quite interested in, in birds and bird watching, and that's my main hobby. He's greenkeeper at the John O'Gaunt Golf Club in Bedfordshire, and over the last nine years, backed by the club, he's made and put up over a hundred nest boxes. We've got this sort of size box, which is ideal for things like blue tits and great tits. Uh, moving on to next size up uh, for woodpeckers. Um, so fill them with wood chippings because they like to excavate their own hole. And then we've got bigger boxes like, like this one here, which is ideal for things like stock dove, jackdaws will use it, maybe grey squirrel. And we've got kestrel box here and a tawny owl box. Out on the course, rough areas of grass encourage mammals and insects. Otters and water vole live here. 99 species of bird have been recorded on the course, but not all needed a helping hand. Just going to take a look in this electric box. All right. <laughs> pair of great tits nesting. And there's one live one just in the bottom of the nest. Oh, yeah. A minute later, and a parent returns with a tasty morsel. Steve's now being trained as a bird ringer, and there are plenty of boxes to check. Inside this one, seven great tit chicks, all about a week old. Steve's done a fantastic job here, and it's not just the nest boxes that we're looking at today, um, all the rough areas, there's loads of really good stuff that he's done for, for wildlife here and it just shows what you can do if you look after a golf course well. And the hard work has its rewards. Yeah, it's fantastic just to know that, you know, all the work that I've done is, is, is worth proving it's worth. So, one box down, many more to go. Richard Daniel, BBC Look East, Bedfordshire. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as I said, it's a nice little summary uh, of everything I've done uh, over the last 30 years. As you go, uh, put the kettle on. Just remember, the golf course is not just a golf course. It should be a conservation dream. There can be more than one type of birdie on a golf course. Thank you for listening.